Well, welcome back to my shop here at my 2001 Beaver Patriot Thunder Class A diesel motorhome. And today I want to try to demystify installing lithium iron phosphate batteries on a modern RV or a used one. Now, the, although I will be talking about motorized RVs and motorhomes, there are some points that are vital to uh, towable units too, like a fifth wheel or a travel trailer. Now, I just very recently, like two days ago, installed this 460 amp hour lithium iron phosphate house battery right here from Vader. Don't pay attention to that. And I replaced my four, four AGM six volt lead acid batteries. I know there's a lot of channels out there and a lot of information available online to explain how lithium batteries work, but I'm going to try to simplify it for a modern RVer. First things first, this is a lithium iron phosphate or LIPO4 uh, battery that I installed. A lot of RVers and do-it-yourselfers do want to switch to lithium batteries, but there's a lot of, I wouldn't call it misinformation out there, but there is some fear out there that lithium batteries can cause an uncontrollable uh, fire. But even though these are still considered lithium batteries, the lithium iron phosphate right there, LIFEPO4, is almost adverse to actually starting on fire or causing fire. So fire safety is not something you have to worry about if you go with a lithium iron phosphate battery. This is why a lot of uh, RVers are now going to these lithium iron phosphate batteries. Also, this obviously is not an electric vehicle or handheld power tool or rechargeable flashlight. So the added weight that you'll find in iron on these batteries is not nearly as much of a concern as uh, it would be in something handheld like uh, this battery here. And while these batteries here may cause a fire if you did puncture them or charge them incorrectly, fire is not a concern with lithium iron phosphate batteries, okay? So that's the first thing I wanted to talk about with lithium batteries in an RV. Lithium iron phosphate batteries won't be a cause of fire. You won't have to worry about that on your RV, okay? Very important. I think a lot of that misinformation stems from uh, back in the day when you had to make your own lithium battery out of uh, different modules and create your own system where you were basically hacking a battery and using it to uh, your own needs as far as uh, RV use goes. But these are off-the-shelf manufactured batteries for RV use now. But in keeping with that first problem of your homemade batteries would be the second one issue, which is the, the BMS. A lot of people are worried about uh, charging the batteries correctly uh, with an established system that was not intended for lithium batteries. Now, don't get me wrong, a lithium battery does have a different charge profile than a lead acid battery, an AGM battery, or a dry cell battery. However, most modern manufacturers for the lithium batteries have a smart BMS or battery management system that can accept most charging from most systems. The real limitation comes from the fact that lithium batteries need a higher voltage charge to get a 100% top off charge on them than a standard uh, RV converter or inverter gives them. Even right here, it says if charging voltage is lower than 13.8, the battery power cannot be fully charged. So a modern BMS system built into these batteries is its own little uh, brain, computer, gateway that's going to take whatever charging's coming in and regulate that to the battery itself, monitoring each individual cell for over uh, current or over temperature situations and adjust the charging accordingly. The problem is if the voltage isn't high enough, you won't get to 100%. You might only get to 90% charge on your uh, lithium battery unless you upgrade to a charger with a lithium profile on it. Now on most towable units like this fifth wheel or a travel trailer will have a converter or battery charger in the basement area or under a cabinet. And usually looks like this box right there. And they put out about 13.6 volts DC. So just underneath that uh, top off that we need. So if you have a towable with a converter like this, uh, a new one's about three to $500 with that lithium profile on it. it. Wouldn't be too difficult to change out if you really wanted to. However, on a motorized unit, like my motorhome right here that has a built-in inverter charger, like this Magnum uh, 2800 inverter, changing out that entire inverter for a lithium profile, uh, that's about $2,500 and probably not worth it. 
just to make sure that you get that extra 10% of charge on your batteries because you just can't upgrade uh, with software on these things. That would be too easy. Though I think you can with the Victron system, but not with the Magnum or, or uh, Xantrax or some of the more common inverter chargers you'll find out there. So what I'm telling you is uh, you do not have to upgrade your charging system to a lithium compatible uh, battery charger from your motorhome or your towable. If you don't want to, you just won't get to 100% fully charged on your lithium battery. It would not be a bad thing either because most lithium battery manufacturers don't want you to keep it at 100% all the time. So what is an RVer or a do-it-yourselfer supposed to do if they want to get 100% uh, out of those uh, lithium batteries without upgrading to a very expensive uh, charger or inverter setup? More than likely, if you're upgrading to lithium uh, batteries for energy storage, you're probably putting solar on the roof or have solar on the roof. I would recommend that uh, you take that money you would have spent on a new charger or inverter and invest in solar, a little bit bigger solar than you thought you were going to use. Because with at least 500 watts of solar on the roof and fairly inexpensive MPP charge controller like this one I have from Renergy, it will have a uh, profile for charging lithium batteries in a modern setup. So you get that last 10% of charge on your house batteries from the solar above for a fraction of the cost of a new inverter or a lithium compatible converter in the basement. Don't misunderstand me, we can change the settings on this inverter. Even though it doesn't have um, a lithium setting on, if I go to battery type, I can go to custom right here and then I can make some changes to it. The lithium batteries might come with an owner's manual to tell you what the settings they recommend would be. So on mine, it's just recommending between 14.2 and 14.6. Yours might be different. But if I go to my custom settings right there, uh, basically 14.6 is where we want it to uh, be. We could go 14.5. I don't think it's going to matter. Uh, float, anything below 13.6 should be fine. Uh, 13.5 is fine for me. And equalize, that's as low as I can get is 14.6. And that's basically it. Now I'm only really showing you this because I know a lot of people would ask me this question. But my point is this. The modern BMS systems on all these uh, modern uh, lithium batteries really won't require any of this. They do all the calculations for you. as You don't really have to worry about a charge profile like you would have a few years ago. So that's the second thing to know about modern lithium iron phosphate batteries is you really do not have to completely upgrade your charging system to match to lithium profiles, okay? It's important to know. That does lead us into the third most important thing to know about converting your RV to a lithium battery. And while there are over a handful of reasons to upgrade to lithium batteries as it is, be it for weight savings, uh, low maintenance, energy density, or of course, relocating your batteries completely inside a sealed compartment where you don't have to worry about ventilating uh, hydrogen gas or acid spilling. One of the better features about lithium batteries is that they can charge very quickly. Unlike lead acid batteries like this, if you completely discharge them, it could take theoretically two days to fully charge lead acid batteries. But if you completely deplete a lithium battery, you can charge these very quickly in a matter of three hours. So if we look at the specs on my uh, Vader 460 amp hour capacity battery, it can accept 120 amps or current running into it to charge it. Now while towable units like this fifth wheel right here do receive a charge from their tow vehicle through the seven-way plug umbilical right here, usually that's maxed out about 30 amps of uh, draw on it. But on a motorhome like my diesel pusher there or this Georgetown right there, the house batteries are always wired up to the uh, chassis alternator for charging. And even on a great big huge alternator, like this 200 amp alternator you might find on my motorhome, 120 amps straight to those batteries will start to overheat that alternator after like three hours of charging it. Let alone the smaller alternators you'll find on these Ford chassis for the Class A motorhomes or the Class C motorhomes. So this is an important thing to know about. We don't want to burn out your alternator with a lithium battery and that could happen if you don't plan for it. Now this is not a in-depth tutorial about every motorhome out there because uh, they're all a little bit different but every motorhome out there will have a battery isolator because they'll have a house battery and chassis batteries they want to keep separate unless they're charging both of them off the engine 
when it's running. So on my setup right here, I literally have a battery isolator right above. This is a solid state uh, diode basically in there with a heat sink on there. Alternator goes in the middle and you have a house battery and your engine battery that separates the charge out. Over here I have what's called an auxiliary start, but we'll talk about that later. However, these solid state uh, isolators fell out of favor about 2002 and almost everything went over to the uh, charge solenoid right there or auxiliary start solenoid right here. Your motorhome might have a charge solenoid that looks like this to charge a house battery when the engine's running or like this or a big boy like this, okay? Currently, there's two common methods to alleviate concerns about burning out your alternator on your motorhome if you upgrade to lithium batteries. Now, I don't have an example of the uh, most popular method, which is to get a DC to DC converter, which will basically just be a programmable choke to limit the amount of current that the uh, lithium batteries can accept, or could pass through. You do have to uh, set it up and program it and understand how the system works. It is a little bit more complicated, and in my opinion, a lot more expensive and more difficult for uh, both the DIYer and the RV tech that may not know you put that in. The second and easiest method, in my opinion, is to get a smart relay. There are a few different ones on the market, but this is gonna be the most common one from uh, pr uh, Precision Circuits right there. Really, it just has a logic built into it that's both a timer and a choke. It's really not too different from the uh, bird uh, bi-directional isolator relay that you got from Intellitech that you might find on a lot of uh, motorhomes out there, especially diesel pushers. If the coach batteries or the house batteries start drawing too much amperage, it will open up this uh, relay right here and everything still goes to the chassis batteries just fine. Now I do realize that is an oversimplification of the performance and the logic of this. It does have a timer built into it too where it will cycle on and off. But basically, uh, if the house batteries, the lithium batteries are drawing too much power from the alternator, it will disengage this for a set of time and then re-engage it again. As it draws too much again, it disengages it. And then as a the battery starts coming up in uh, uh, voltage or uh, capacity, uh, it stops drawing as much power over time. And where that's going to be a real big problem is uh, if your lithium battery is nearly completely discharged, that's where it's going to accept a lot of uh, amperage anyways. But even on an uh, Intellitech system right here with the bird, it would click and unclick the house battery charge solenoid too. So this really mimics the whole thing, but it's a little bit smarter and set up for lithium batteries where this is not set up for lithium batteries at all. It just has different parameters in it. Also, it's not the same thing. So obviously I'm gonna be going with this method right here to protect my alternator. It's the simplest method. It's fairly do-it-yourself. Even though mine's gonna be a lot more complicated than most people's out there. So like I said, I have uh, the battery isolator right here. I'm gonna to have to move the alternator to the chassis side right here on the same side of this post right there. And then the uh, house side, I will be moving to the coach battery side right there. Now for added difficulty, uh, this also has ignition, ground, and uh, signal. I don't have that at my solid state uh, battery isolator, so I'm gonna have to run that too. But luckily, I do have ignition right over here, just off of my board. So I'm gonna have to disconnect my batteries, both the house batteries and the chassis batteries to wire this in. There's really not a lot of safety on any of these battery cables. They're all directly to the batteries. Okay, get that. And that's the important one. All right, now the chassis battery is disconnected. We'll do the same on the house battery too. All right, so I have labeled the chassis battery, the alternator, and the house battery back there. I'm just gonna disconnect all these battery cables and we'll get the other thing hooked up and I'll try to explain everything else is going on up here. All right, so here's the original solid state battery isolator. Should be able to see. A1 and 2, so alternator, battery 1, battery 2. Basically, it would just uh, split up uh, the voltage default to the chassis starting battery and go to the other battery if there was enough power to go to that side too. Just the big diodes are in there to uh, regulate it all, and that's a heat sink around it. The other thing I removed was the uh, echo charger. This is the original one that came with the uh, RV. Uh, it's a pretty solid state unit too, just what it sounds like. If the house batteries were charging, it would charge the chassis batteries with a little trickle charge to it also. I'm just going to remove this for... All 
uh, I don't simplicity basically we won't worry about that for now and then the next thing up here is going to be the uh, auxiliary starter battery boost solenoid because uh, chassis battery is going up past that anyways too so this we'll get into on uh, very shortly but I'm removing this too so this just has a ground wire ran to it. There's going to be signal from the dash, and then we just have house and batteries, and then this is a solar hookup from the original solar. There's ground. And that was the uh, ground that came off the uh, boost solenoid there. Right. And then this is the ignition lead that will activate that charge solenoid that I tapped off of the uh, rear start switch. So before we go any further, I need to connect these uh, chassis batteries back up. All right, so I have the new uh, relay, smart relay installed right there. This is just the ignition uh, feed from uh, the switch over there. And we do have it hooked up. I've made a new cable if you guys are asking. That's what that is for now. That's why I told you to ignore my short one. That was just a uh, another temporary solution. <laughs> We've went ahead and removed the battery isolator, solid state one. We've removed the solid state echo charger. And we've removed the old battery boost relay or solenoid. More on this later. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at our batteries. Right now we're on ground down there. Positive there, 12.4546. And then on the house side, which is there, <laughs> 13.4. Huh. From this relay right there, I didn't know it was bi-directional, so I'm wondering if, because I do have solar and it is charging. I go to the chassis battery now. Look at that. We're charging the chassis battery. So this is bi-directional. I did not realize that was bi-directional. So that eliminates the need for those down there, which I did want to talk about later too. First things first, I will have to get a little bit off of uh, the house battery so that we can see if the engine's charging it. Uh, reading 99% charged. Uh, we're at, uh, what's our voltage? 13.34 volts. So let me go ahead and turn the inverter on. And make sure the refrigerator's on, which it is. And... It's inverting. Probably be an easier way to burn off some of the voltage here, so let's go ahead and convection bake. Oh, uh, stupid clock. So let's bake it to 360 in there. So look at that, we're drawing 205 amps currently. All right, so in the app right here, it is showing 217 amps drawing out. And our voltage did drop to 12.8, 12.9. While that's preheating, I'm curious about one thing back here. If we're still charging the chassis battery or not. Or if we dropped out. Yeah, so it did drop down. So that's good. So that's actually a pretty good selling point. That This might be better than a DC to DC uh, converter. I was unaware it was bi-directional. That's kind of cool. I didn't want to use this or this to charge the chassis battery because their tolerances aren't quite in uh, theory with uh, lithium batteries because they're set up to, pretty, to start charging at about 12.8 and of course that battery's fully charged at about 13.2 uh, or so. So even if the lithium battery wasn't being charged, uh, its voltage is so high that it would start charging the chassis battery off the coach battery and run that down to 12.7 or 6 which is pretty low for that lithium battery so that's why i want to took him out i'm sorry the convection oven is ready at this point it's nice and hot in there so if i pull out the app and i take a look at it right now it looks like i'm at 86 percent our battery voltage is 13.16 now so I think this should be good enough at this point to start the engine and see how we're doing. Now the 33.47 amps is I'm still running the refrigerator and of course my kitchen lights are 110 lights along with the wall sconces there, there, 
And there. Let me go ahead and start this up. Alright, so our battery is charging at 14 volts. The house. It just clicked in at 13.5. It's pulling 106 amps off the alternator to charge this. Bring up the app, it only shows 60 amps are currently going to the battery. The rest is going to be powering up the refrigerator, the lights, and the 12 volt. In fact, you can see the inverter is pulling about 27, 28 amps by itself. down to 13.6 on the chassis battery. Now I understand this is not really a fair test to see if the alternator is going to get burned out or that a relay is going to work or not because lithium batteries draw the most when the battery is fairly depleted. So 10 to 20 to 30 percent depleted that's where it's going to really spike. That's what lithium batteries are great for. They can charge quickly. At 86 percent it's not going to draw as much as you might expect to have so we probably won't be having a problem with the alternator here i'm not doing a complete breakdown of this whole system here i'm just trying to elaborate what you do need to worry about if you do upgrade to lithium batteries with a motorhome but you know just because people do want to see it we'll go ahead and put it into high idle there's a cat so we have to do it this way hold down resume so even at high idle of I'm about 1200 RPMs right now. It hasn't affect the current whatsoever. Maybe it helps cool the alternator off a little bit more with a faster fan speed on the alternator, but that's about it. All right, so we've covered that base now. It is important upgrading your motorhome house battery to lithium that you do consider the alternator from your motorhome engine, okay? And so a DC to DC converter or a smart charge relay is going to be what you want to make sure you do cover it's important on that i do agree to this the bms is not smart enough to affect your uh, alternator okay so think it through the last thing i do want to talk about is your battery boost on a motorhome and this only applies to motorhomes has nothing to do with uh, towables fifth wheels trailers things like that Traditionally, RV manufacturers took advantage of the fact that on a motorhome you have a set of chassis batteries to start the engine and a house battery for all your interior lighting and appliances. So that if your chassis or engine starting battery went dead, you could jump start the motorhome engine off the house batteries. You cannot do that with a lithium battery. That is one of the true limitations of a lithium battery. Now the BMS built into it will limit current flowing out of it. Now on the battery I installed, its maximum continuous discharge current is 250 amps, okay? After that, it'll shut the battery down. If you know anything about starting an engine, especially a diesel engine, they require a lot more uh, cranking amps on them. I think each one of these is about a thousand cold cranking amps. So put together, we have about 2000 cold cranking amps to start my massive Caterpillar C12 turbo diesel engine here. And if you do the math, it's simple math, 2,000 is a lot more than 250 amps. So you cannot start the engine with the lithium battery after you install it. Now I do still have my signal right here that we haven't hooked up. And I will hook it up to the signal uh, post down there. And on my RV, it corresponds with this uh, momentary switch that looks like a battery. You can click and hold that down. That'll link the two batteries together. A lot of other motorhomes out there, it might say auxiliary start, or mom switch or emergency start on it. That will link the two batteries together. You cannot start the engine. Can I tell you this one more time? You cannot start the engine off your lithium battery at this point. So all this switch will do in the future is you can push and hold it down to charge the chassis batteries off your house batteries. And it'll take a 30 minutes to an hour of holding that down to hopefully get enough charge on the chassis batteries to start the engine this time. If that's not going to work for you, what I would recommend you do is invest in a freestanding battery charger to bring with you in your basement. That way you can start your generator, 
or plug into an extension cord and charge your chassis batteries the old school way. So there, I have it hooked back up again to the uh, signal up there. Hopefully you guys can hear it. Let me go ahead and lock it in place. All right, I had to use something a little bit more aggressive than paper. Ground again right there. Thirteen point one eight. Thirteen point one. There we go. So it is charging the chassis battery off the uh, coach battery now. And then that'll disengage it. But that was pretty much everything I wanted to show you guys uh, concerning the, uh, the four important things to think about when you're switching your RV from a lead acid battery to a lithium battery. Uh, there's a lot of uh, information out there and I don't think a lot of people cover these four important items. So hopefully that helps somebody. I got a lot to put back together. So let me just clean up my mess here. Now what I think I'm trying to say, which might be unpopular to a lot of people out there, is that the modern BMS of a lithium iron phosphate battery is already built up to be the gateway for the charge of the battery anyways. So if the charger does have a lithium profile set up for it, it still has to go through the BMS built into the battery itself. All the lithium profile is doing is raising the voltage enough to get 100% charge out of the battery. You're still going to want to go to your battery manufacturer's uh, specifications. They're probably going to say they want to keep it about 80-85% charge most of the time. They don't really want you to go to that 100% and the only way to get that 100% is going to be with that lithium charge. So you're not going to damage your uh, batteries with a normal RV charger or an inverter. You just won't get it up to 100%. Uh, I just don't want people to uh, not get a lithium battery because they don't. They look and say, well, I'm going to have to buy $2,000 for a new inverter. I'm going to have to buy a whole huge setup with a bus bar, charge controller, gateway, uh, Bluetooth connectivity for all of this, uh, just so I can have a lithium battery. I don't want you to have that as a limiting factor for it. Uh, there are a lot of, I think there are a lot of overly complicated battery setups that people are putting into RVs. You have to have a, an engineering degree or electrical engineering degree to understand the pathway for all of it. And as an RV owner or a do-it-yourselfer, I don't think it's as vital as uh, a lot of people are letting on. This isn't the, uh, the world of five years ago where you didn't have off-the-shelf features with a BMS on it. The modern BMS is doing all the work for you. Don't try to overthink this or overcomplicate it is my advice. Of course, always check with the battery manufacturer. I can tell you that Vader right here basically said, you're A-OK -okay if you want 100%, you're going to have to get a lithium charge profile out of it. But that's why I did my cost saving and I uh, used my MPP charge controller with a lithium profile on it. Like I said, it might be a little bit of an unpopular opinion, so blow me up in the comments if you think I'm wrong, but I think I'm right. And don't forget, these have a BMS built into them also, and we trust those and treat them like trash. Or make sure, or make sure it is, some, or, or make sure you do, or make sure you do get that installed, okay? Important on that, I will agree. It is important, or make sure you get that installed.